so um, welcome back. I hope you guys had a good spring break. I know um, we weren't able to really go out and do too much, but I hope you were at least able to enjoy the nice weather that um, we've been having. Um, so I know that those of you who are passing, this is not required these next few weeks, but I really hope that everybody will choose to watch the videos and participate. Um, I think that the next few um, mini modules that we have are fairly interesting content and it's the leftover portion of biology we weren't able to cover um, during while we we're in person at school um, and it's fairly interesting content and as well as it'll probably be helpful for you guys to know this stuff for your upcoming science classes um, so the way that it'll work from here on out is there will be a new module posted every two weeks, so you'll have two weeks to complete each module. Um, the module will have three tasks, and it will also have some optional additional things for you guys to explore if you so wish and are interested in the content. Um, this first module is going to be all about evolution and natural selection. Um, the next one will be about classification. Um, how organisms are classified in our world. And the last one will be about cladograms and phylogenies. Um, so again, I hope everybody chooses to participate. Um, just a heads up, those of you whose grade is currently not passing, um, again, you have until April 17th to get your grade up to passing, and you will pass for the year. You'll get an A for the year. Um, and then those of you who are not passing by April 17th will have to complete all of the activities in each of the three modules that we post in order to receive a passing score for the year. So if you're currently not passing, you can choose category A or B. You can either work on getting your grade up by doing past material, or you can do everything from the three modules that we post, starting with this one and doing this, this full module as well as the complete the two modules after this as well. Either one will get you passing for the year. Alright, so here we go. The way that this one's going to work, this is I'll go through this PowerPoint about evolution. I'll talk through it. Um, and the task for this um, video will be to answer these questions. So this, this doc has been um, attached. You will, I'll give certain places to pause during the video you guys will pause your screen and answer the questions based on what we talked about during the, the PowerPoint so make sure you have this doc up and ready um, to answer these questions as we go and if you need a second you can go ahead and pause the video to be sure you get this up okay so in this video, we're going to be talking about evolution, and evolution is how organisms change over time. But before we get into all the hairy details about evolution and natural selection, I do want to take a moment to talk about um, the time scale that we are talking about with evolution. So the Earth is 4.65 billion years old, so billion years old. Um, so when we refer to changes happening over the course of 50,000 years, 100,000 years, several hundred thousand years, that's fairly small um, on the time scale of Earth. Time on Earth is, is immense. It's so hard to conceptualize what 4 billion actually is because it's, it's just so large. It's hard. Like humans... It, to conceptualize billions is is hard. Um, it's it's hard to conceptualize a million. I mean, you may, maybe you've seen a million gr blades of grass or something in a field, but conceptualizing how big billion is, four billion, it's it's hard to conceptualize. So I just want to make 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 you aware that we're talking about very large scales of time. Um, so evolution itself is when living things change 
over time. So this little chart that we have, um, sorry, on the screen here, it starts with organisms way, way, way long ago, the very first ones. And over time, organisms have changed, new species have branched off, and things have changed way over time. And these changes are due to changes on the earth, and organisms adapt and change to fit their environment. Um, the first scientist that actually studied evolution was a man named Charles Darwin. He's known as the father of evolution. Um, Darwin had a boat called the HMS Beagle. He sailed around various places on the earth. He is most known for his studies that were conducted in the Galapagos Islands. And at the Galapagos Islands, he saw a various number of different creatures to study. Um, he saw turtles and uh, various other land mammals that aren't found anywhere else in the world. Um, but he is most known for his study of finches. Um, and with his work on with finches done at the... Um, Galapagos Islands, he proposed the theory that evolution happens through a process called natural selection. Natural selection is essentially nature selects or nature chooses the best traits. So in the diagram here on the screen, we have three birds and some beetles. Our beetles live on a ground that's a sandy color. The birds um, either land on the ground or swoop by and eat beetles. To survive. Um, if the ground is a sandy color, beetles that blend in best with the sandy colored um, environment are going to be the ones that are going to survive because if the beetle is able to blend in with its background, the birds aren't going to be able to see it. So this is showing how birds are going to eat the green beetles because they stand out. It's really easy for the bird to see the green beetle and eat it versus the beetles that blend in. So nature chooses to select the beetles that blend in for the ones that survive because they're able to blend in, they're less likely to get eaten, they're going to be the ones that survive long term. Alright, so at this point you're going to pause and go over to your sheet here and answer question number one. And question number one is how are natural selection and evolution related? So natural selection, again, nature selects the best traits and evolution is change over long periods of time. So how are evolution and natural selection related? Go ahead and pause, answer that question on your sheet. All right, we're getting back into talking a bit more about natural selection. So natural selection is when organisms with the best genes or the most adaptable genes for that environment that the organism lives in, they live, pass on their genes. Therefore, organisms that have negative genes, ones that aren't good to have in the environment in which they live, they're going to be the ones that are more likely going to get eaten and then eventually die out. So what's going to happen is natural selection is going to lead to organisms that have adaptations for their environment. So an adaptation is a trait that's going to evolve over time that's going to make an organism more likely to survive. So in this image, we have a moth on bark. So the moth lives on a tree. And the moth has evolved an adaptation, which is a trait, that makes it look like the tree that it lives on. So any bird or organism like swooping by looking for something yummy to eat is not going to be able to see this moth. Therefore, this moth is going to live, it's going to pass on its traits, and it's going to be happy and healthy. So therefore, the ability to blend in the trait that causes this moth to be the same color as the bark is an adaptation that's going to allow it to survive over time. So adaptations allow organisms to survive and or reproduce in their environment. And you might be thinking, there are some examples you can think of where maybe this isn't necessarily the case. Um, the best one from this slide here is um, when we look at a peacock. This is a male peacock. Male peacocks can be very bright colored. This one here is bright blue. And it has a large array of beautiful feathers. And you might be thinking, this is going to be um, kind of hard to blend in with an environment. If you're bright blue, you're going to stand out. 
you're carrying around a huge tail of feathers, it's going to be harder to run and evade predators. Versus the female peacock here, pretty easy to blend into an environment. No huge tail of feathers, it can probably run away from predators really quickly. And you might be thinking, well, the males aren't exactly in the best position here. However, the ultimate goal is for these male peacocks to pass on their traits. And the way that they do that is by being selected by females to mate. So female peacocks select the brightest and most beautiful male peacock to reproduce with. So if the male peacock is beautiful, then he's more likely to pass on his genes. And that's why he has these traits that stand out. Whereas the female peacock is the one who's actually going to be having the offspring, birthing the offspring, caring for the offspring. They have to be able to blend in and survive to take care of the offspring. So that's why there's sometimes this odd dynamic um, amongst males and females. So one example of an adaptation is the ability to camouflage. This actually looks like just some um, leaves. Sorry, that was my dog. Uh, looks like some leaves in the forest, but we have a lizard here. Blending in, camouflaging with the environment. Another beneficial adaptation is the ability to mimic. So the honeybee, which you see here, will actually sting and harm predators. Versus the hoverfly isn't actually a bee, won't sting a predator. But it kind of looks like a bee. If I saw this, you know, out in the wild, I wouldn't want to mess with it because I think it would might sting me. But this is called mimicry. This harmless, innocent fly looks an awful lot like a bee because it benefits from looking like a bee. If other organisms think it's a bee, it's not going to mess with it. It's not going to try to eat it because it's going to be afraid of getting stung. This happens in all different types of species. Um, also noticeably organisms like snakes. Um, uh, the stink that Mr. Dumpy has in his classroom is harmless. But it looks like a very poisonous snake. And it's because out in the wild, if you look like a poisonous snake, no one's going to mess with you. You're going to be more likely to survive. So at this point, you're going to pause and flip over and answer questions two and three on your document. Question number two asks, natural selection is best defined as which of the following? So which one of these defines natural selection? And then question three, list three adaptations that help the tiger survive and reproduce. So if you're looking at this tiger here, what are three traits or adaptations that it has that's going to make it more likely to survive and therefore reproduce? So go ahead and pause and answer your questions. Okay, a few more details on natural selection. Natural selection is also known as survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest because the organism that's the most so-called fit in its environment is going to be the one that's going to survive and reproduce. However, I do want to point out that um, in biology, being fit does not mean you go to the gym, you work out, you're buff. Fittest means you have the traits necessary to survive. So being able, whatever makes you able to survive and reproduce makes you fit. So fit may be a little differently than what you would traditionally think of as fit. So organisms that are fit survive and reproduce and whatever makes them able to do that makes them fit. So if we were to look at a population, any population, you're going to see differences among that population. Whether you're looking at humans or monkeys or ants, there's always differences between populations of organisms. In this case, we're looking at a population of fish. So these fish, they're going to be different sizes, shapes, and speeds. They're all different within the one population. Um, however, Whatever traits you have, whatever one is going to help you survive in your environment are going to be the ones that live. So if you, for instance, are a fish that's able to swim really fast, you're going to be able to get away from predators. Versus if you're a small, slow fish, like these guys here, you're going to get eaten and you're going to die. So if you are a fast fish, being fast is inevitably going to make you fit because you're able to survive and therefore reproduce. But what this is going to cause are changes in the population over time. So the original population that you have is going to look different over 
many, many generations. Because what's going to happen is you're going to start with a population. Um, various differences here. You're going to have organisms get eaten. The ones that survive are going to pass on their traits and reproduce. And then over time, this population here is going to evolve to look like this one. Because over time, the ones that survive are going to pass on their traits. And you're going to have more organisms with those traits. So over time, you'll have more fast fish. In this case here, these guys here with the stripes are the ones that didn't get eaten. Therefore, they're going to reproduce and you're going to have more striped fish. So Darwin also looked at... Um, finches or birds and he noticed that they have different size beaks so some birds would have really big beaks some would have really small beaks some would have really long some beaks would be really short and those beaks corresponded to the food that the birds ate however if a bird was found let's say on an island that had big nuts or uh, large seeds um, and that was the food source on that island the birds that had the biggest beaks are going to be the ones that are going to survive and reproduce. Whereas the birds with the really small beaks weren't going to be able to crack the nuts or eat the seeds if they were larger. So the food therefore drove what type of beaks the birds would have. Alright, so now you're going to pause and you're going to flip over to that question sheet again. Um, you're going to answer questions 4 and 5. Question 4 asks, what adaptation did the fish have and evolve over time? And question five is going to be, what adaptation did the finches have? So if you need to go back, you're just going to recall what adaptation did the fish have, and then what adaptation did the finches have? So you may be asking, um, what evidence do we have for evolution? As I'm sure you know, evolution can be a... Um, debatable topic um, amongst individuals in the world. Um, so I do want to emphasize that evolution is a theory. So theories, again, are um, hypotheses that have been tested many, many times and seem to be true. Meaning, scientists have a reason to believe that evolution is true. Um, we have many pieces of evidence in support of evolution. However, if that doesn't mean that science and other experiments can't be done that disprove the idea of evolution, and that's why this can be a very debatable topic. Um, so the um, reasons that we have to believe that evolution may be true are the presence of fossils, anatomy, and biochemistry. And we're going to talk about each of those in detail. So fossils, I'm sure you know, are the remains of long dead organisms. And what scientists are able to do are they're able to look at the fossils, look at the bone structure, the size, the shape that organisms had over periods of time. And the way that they do this is by looking at different segments of Earth by digging deep. And the, we can make a timeline of what organisms looked like in a particular area over time. And this is called the principle of superposition. And that means the position of the fossil in the ground tells us how old the fossil is. So at the very, very top of the ground are going to be our newest fossils, the most recent organisms there, if they had died and fossilized. The deeper we go, the older that they get. So the deeper in the ground, you're going to have your oldest fossils, and at the very, very top, you're going to have the newest or the youngest. So this can kind of make a timeline of history by just looking at different segments of the Earth. So if scientists are studying a particular area, they can see what type of organisms lived in that area over time, from millions of years ago to very recently. And they can also see if there are any changes to that particular environment. So if scientists are studying um, a particular area on Earth, and they notice that way deep in the ground they find fossils from organisms that look like fish that would live in an aquatic environment, and on the top, they find what looks like land mammals. They know that at one point, that section of Earth that they are studying used to be covered by water. So fossils can provide a lot of evidence to how things change over time. All right, so you're going to go ahead and pause here. And you're going to answer question number six on your document. Question number six has this exact image. And you're going to use this here to figure out is A, B, C, or D. Which one is the oldest section? 
of rock. Which one is the youngest or most new section of rock? So go ahead and pause, answer that question. Okay, um, section number two, or the second reason that we have to believe um, that evolution could possibly be true is by looking at the anatomy of organisms. And the anatomy of an organism is the way that the body is put together. So um, this leads to different types of structure in the body. So one thing that scientists have noticed is that organisms that share a common ancestor or were once related long ago in time have what are called homologous bone structures. So homo means same, structure means bone structure. So if you look at the human arm, at the very top we have one bone at the top of our arm. We have two bones in the bottom section of our arm. And then we have appendages, which make like long fingers here. So there's a cluster of bones, and it breaks down into several appendages. And what scientists notice is that organisms that have a common ancestor to humans also have this very similar bone structure. So I always sound like Dr. Seuss when I'm reading this, but the arm of a human, the leg of a cat, the fin of a whale, and the wing of a bat, all at the top there's one bone. Just below, just two bones, side by side. Small cluster that make up what would be like the wrist area. And then it branches into different what look like long appendages. And it's the same in all four of these. The bone structures are very similar, making scientists believe that these organisms once had a common ancestor and we are somehow related at one point in time to a human cat, whale, and bat. So again, these are homologous structures, homo meaning same, same bone structure, meaning that we share a common ancestor. We all evolved from a common ancestor. However, scientists also noticed what are called analogous structures. So creating analogy, comparing two things. They look very similar on the outside, but on the inside, they're not that similar at all. So if you look at organisms that live in the water per se, most organisms that live in the water are going to have a structure that looks like a, a flipper or a fin, um, and it's because it helps the organism swim. We all knew that. However, we also know that sharks are fish, penguins are birds, and dolphins are mammals. They all live in the water. They're not related because a fish and a bird and a mammal, they're, they're completely different. They're not related, but they all have this similar structure on the outside that helps them swim. And the reason that they have this is not because they're related, but because they live in the water. If you live in the water, having a structure that looks like this is going to help you swim and get around. So while these organisms are not related, the bone structure is not the same. They look the same on the outside. So analogous structures are when organisms look the same on the outside, but are not related. And the only reason they have them and they look so similar is because they live in a similar place. Therefore, that structure is going to be beneficial to have. Okay, so at this point, you're going to pause and answer question number seven. Question number seven asks, what's the difference between a homologous and an analogous structure? So what's the difference between a homologous and an analogous structure? So go ahead and pause and answer question seven. Okay, reason number three that scientists have to support the idea of evolution is biochemistry. And if you remember way back, we talked about biochemistry and we talked about uh, molecules such as DNA. And scientists are able to compare the genes found in DNA of various organisms and therefore figure out how related we are based on how similar our DNA is. So if we were looking at this chart here, this chart looks at the amino acids and the protein hemoglobin, which is found in blood. So when you look here, it's just a section of this protein. You notice that the human gene or the human protein for hemoglobin is identical to the chimpanzee um, protein for human hemoglobin, meaning humans and chimpanzees are fairly related because we share a common ancestor. Followed closely by horse, oh, so followed closely by gorilla, and then lastly by horse and zebra. So we have three similarities with the gorilla and only one with the horse and zebra. So we are 
We are related most closely to the chimpanzee, followed by the gorilla and the horse and the zebra because our protein hemoglobin has a very similar structure. So you're going to stop and pause and answer question 8. Question 8 asks, how does this information in this chart, it's the same one we just looked at before, support the idea that humans are more closely related to gorillas than to zebras? So how does this chart show that humans are more closely related to gorillas than to zebras? So go ahead and pause and answer question 8. Okay, from all of this um, that we've talked about that scientists have gathered um, about how organisms change over time. There are two different um, theories of how evolution happens over time, um, or types of evolution, I suppose you could say. So when organisms come from a common ancestor, they exhibit what is called divergent evolution, which means if two things diverge, they start together and then they split out. So for divergent evolution, that means that organisms are related, they do share a common ancestor. However, they might look different on the outside, but have internal similarities. So this brings us back to the human, cat, whale, and bat, the forearms of them. Um, again, these are homologous structures. Homologous structures, same bone structure, is caused by divergent evolution because they share a common ancestor. We have a common ancestor, so our bones look similar. They're homologous or very similar. However, humans live all over the earth, cats walk around on all fours, whales live in the ocean, and bats fly. We live in different places, so we have different adaptations that help us survive in our environment. It wouldn't be beneficial for a whale to have a human hand in the ocean, and it wouldn't be helpful for a bat to have a cat leg. It's beneficial for, in the ocean, to have a fin and in the air to fly, and if you're a human, to be able to grip. So we have different adaptations for our, the different environments they live in, but we are related and we do share a common ancestor, which is very different from convergent evolution, which means we converge or come together. To converge means kind of like to hit on, to come together. Um, so convergent evolution means you come from different places, not related at all, but you might look the same just because you live in a similar place. So analogous structures are caused by convergent evolution because you live in the same location. And it's beneficial to have that trait in the location you live in. And there are two current schools of thought about how evolution happens over time. The first is gradualism. Gradualism states that organisms change slowly but constantly or steadily over time. So this, in this school of thought, scientists would believe that evolution happens slowly but constantly over time. That's called gradualism, gradual changes over time. However, scientist Stephen J. Gold proposed a different theory of how evolution happens over time, and his theory is the one that is supported by the evidence that we have. And instead of things changing at a constant rate, he noticed that over time, one species would stay the same for a long time until it rapidly changed, and then that species would stay the same for a long time until it rapidly changed, and then that species would stay the same for a long time. And he called this punctuated equilibrium, meaning that speciation or new species being created, it doesn't just happen gradually over time. It happens at like short bursts. So a species is going to stay the same for a long period of time until something changes and the organisms have to change in response. And all the charts that we have that show number of species when they arise, how they change, also with this along a scale of time, like this graph here shows time versus how organisms are changing and coming into existence, and it and it supports the idea that an organism stays the same, rapid change stays the same, rapid change, and that's called punctuated equilibrium. So evolution happens at rapid bursts. An organism stays the same for a long time until it's forced to change by external uh, factors. 
So that is called punctuated equilibrium. And this process supports all the different um, things that we see through fossils over time. All right, so here's where you're going to pause and you're going to answer questions 9, 10, and 11. So I'm going to go over to show those to you. Question number nine is what is the difference between divergent and convergent evolution? Number 10, what is the difference between gradualism and punctuated equilibrium? And number 11, the hypothesis that evolution occurs at a rapid rate separated by periods of no change, which is true about that. So go ahead and pause, answer that, and then we will finish up. Okay, so um, we're going to now talk about a couple examples of natural selection at work. This one occurred in England during the 1800s. So in the 1800s in England, there were more light colored moths than dark colored moths. And the reason that there were more light colored moths than dark colored moths is because there were light colored trees. There was not that much pollution. The trees were fairly light colored. Light colored moths blended in with them fairly well. The dark colored moths were eaten by birds flying by because they were easily seen. So there are more light colored moths than dark colored moths. However, the Industrial Revolution occurred. Industrial Revolution, lots of factories were being built, lots of pollution. And that made the trees turn a darker color with all the pollution that was in the air. So that change switch the dynamic. Now the dark colored moths blended in with the trees, but the light colored moths stood out. So that's then, it, then over time it switched back. Now there's more dark colored moths that can blend in with the dark soot colored trees, and the light colored moths were eaten more frequently. And that's because, again, the birds can see the lighter colored moths easier than the darker colored moth on the trees. All right, so we're gonna pause and we're gonna flip over here to question 12. Question 12, why did the peppered moth population in Europe shift from light colored moths to more dark colored individuals? What happened that caused the shift from more light colored moths to more dark colored moths? Let's go ahead, pause and answer that question. All right, a more um, modern, uh, example of natural selection is with insect populations and over time insect populations are becoming more resistant to pesticides you can spray all that crazy stuff on them and they're less likely to work and this is happening fairly quickly they're changing fairly quickly and this is because a few insects are surviving the pesticides so there are a few insects in there and all these pesticides are being sprayed around and they have an adaptation that makes them able to resist pesticides, meaning they don't die from pesticides being sprayed. And if they don't die, they have lots of babies, they have lots of babies, and then all their babies are resistant to pesticides. And that is why these things happen so quickly. You spray pesticides, all the insects die except for the ones that can survive during pesticides, what are they going to do? They're going to have tons and tons of babies, and their babies are going to be able to survive the pesticides. And the next thing you know, you got these heroic-looking insects surviving the pesticides, and they're happy, and they're like, gotcha, man. Keep spraying me. I'm still going to live. And again, because insects reproduce fairly rapidly, this can happen quickly. It can change really, really quickly. All right. So this is going to be our last question, the last time you got to pause and answer any questions. So you're going to have, you have four sentences, you have to write at least four sentences, and in your own words, describe how insect populations can develop pesticide resistance using natural selection. So how do insect populations become resistant to pesticides, meaning why over time are less insects gonna die when you spray them with pesticides? Give me four sentences and then submit this assignment on Canvas.